And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the ta to the temple. The two the two headed monster that is currently developing the Crescent TTRPG, a more a more nautical flavored one, i.e., break out your Alestorm playlists. Um, the the in what in the blue corner we have Logan Smith. In the red corner, we have Brian Bettini, and in the middle corner, we do not have a member of the Buffer family because I don't feel like getting sued. <laughs> how you how you doing today, guys? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. I actually just got my second shot today, so a little sore, but otherwise doing good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm getting mine on Friday, so uh, doing better than he is. I've already, I've already had, I've already had both, and um, I don't know. I just, I just, a lot of people were, a lot of people were out of it for a while. I recovered a lot quicker than I thought I would. I didn't even have to take any days off. The uh, the first one wrecked me, um, because I'm a little bit of a wimp when it comes to that stuff. So I'm sure the second one's gonna be a lot of fun. Getting it on my birthday, no less. Did the doctor sing happy birthday while while injecting you? Takes uh, getting shots to a whole new level. Birthday shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I could make a joke about birthday licks, but um, I'd rather not. <laughs> Let's not and say I d and say we did. Fair enough. But a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So I'd like you both to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you guys? Uh, you want to uh, take this first, Logan? Yeah, I can start. Um, a little bit further back? Yeah. So, I sort of started playing around high school-ish time. Um, I had a group of friends that wanted to all play together, and none of us really knew how to play at all, so we started with D&D uh, with 3.5, um, since that was sort of like the popular thing around that time. And uh, it's a sort of complicated system to get into when we started. So we literally didn't have any idea what we were doing. We were just sort of, like, messing around. Um, but as I sort of went on, like, through the years, I ended up playing 3.5 and 5e primarily. But I sort of branched into Pathfinder. Um, and then some, like, lesser-known TTRPGs, like All Flesh Must Be Eaten and a couple like that. Um... I started getting really, like, interested in making my own after some time, um, and that's sort of when I started working on, on Crescent, though. It honestly started out at first, I was, like, rewriting 5e in some ways, and then I was just like, what's the point of doing this, I'm just gonna start working on my own system, and that's sort of what it ended up as. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I've been a, a DM, GM, whatever, for basically the entire time that I've been playing. I... Um, started out as our group's DM, and I've been playing for like seven or eight years now, and there's been very few t times during that uh, period where I haven't been running a campaign. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, I'll um, I'll make sure I'll make sure to to send you a, to to send you a um b the business card for the Forever GM um support group. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of painful sometimes, but I really like making campaigns. I really like making worlds and settings and everything, so... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have too much of a problem with it. Also, it's uh, generally for the better, since your attention span as a player leaves something to be desired. <laughs> but uh, as for me, um, my story actually starts with Logan, the Forever GM. Uh, since I had always wanted to play in, like, middle and high school, but I never had anyone um, to play with. In fact, I hardly had anyone to play games with at all until I went off to college. Um, and lo and behold, you know, I stumbled across Logan, who uh, decided he'd run a 3.5 campaign um, with some friends. Uh, and so we tried that. That didn't last very long. 
Um, Not go well. <laughs> it didn't go that great. It's fine. It was trolly. It was fun. Uh, you know, it got my feet wet. It got me interested. Um, I was finally able to play for the first time. Um, and then we we sort of transitioned into our first real campaign, which was a 5e campaign, um, as you know, many are these days. Um, and that campaign went on for about five years. In fact, we just sort of came out of it um, like a year and a half, two, maybe two years ago now. Um, and like Logan was sort of saying, we had uh, mainly Logan, but we had sort of all homebrewed the system to like uh, uh, high heaven. And there was, it was very uh, much sort of an entirely separate entity than what the 5e was. And so coming out of that campaign, um, we sort of decided, hey, um, instead of just continuing with, you know, trying to make this work for us, why not make something that um, suits what we are looking for instead? Mm -hmm. Now, it, now, fortunately, I, w I will note that the idea of, um, of the, pa the path to Crescent is in very good company. There's a, there's a lot of games that were born out of, um, out, of out of people being dissatisfied with a certain edition of D&D and just doing their own thing. Um, e and it's not it's certainly not a new phenomenon. This kind of thing goes all goes all the way back to I'd, I'd say the um, eight to the early '80s with stuff like Rollmaster and um, and chiv and chivalry and sorcery. But and e and even in more even in more um, recent interpretations, there's been, there's been plenty of setting hacks or rather rule set hacks over over the years. Um. But when it came to the transit, when it came to the transition between Five E and Crescent, what were what were some of the things that you that you um I want to say took issue, but that but that feels a little strong. But I can't think of a better yeah. Story. But no, I, was, I sort of understand what you're talking about. Yeah, that. what were some of the things that you guys kind of took issue with that you wanted to address that you felt Five E was lacking in? Um, I can sort of start with this uh, one of. So, to sort of pick off of, piggyback off of what Brian was saying, um, I ran a campaign for like four years at that point, and it was the longest running campaign that I'd had. Um, and we'd actually gotten past the early levels where most campaigns die, and gotten into some of the higher levels of D&D, like above 10, like around 15 to 20-ish, I think is where we were ending. Um, and I was starting to find that it was difficult to make... Uh, uh, it was difficult to make challenging and interesting encounters and stuff like that in D and D, because I felt like a lot of the things that I was doing were sort of like getting invalidated by some like magical solution or something like that to some extent. And while I do like players solving problems with creativity, I felt to some extent that there was less creativity going creativity going into the solutions and more just like here's this thing that I have that solves the problem that you're presenting to us. So that was one of the things that I was having issues with, um, which I think is sort of a general thought that's shared, especially in a very homebrewed campaign where players have even more tools than they do in, like, standard um, 5e. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was that uh, I greatly missed a lot of the, uh, I guess, like, build options and uh, interesting like martial um, stuff that was possible in 3.5 mm -hmm. um, coming from that because that's where I really started and played a lot in. Um, I sort of missed the enjoyment of uh, like prestige classing into a bunch of different things and picking a bunch of options that you can use to, to help your build. And um, also, I'd really missed. I don't know if you're familiar with 3.5 that much or not, but oh. <laughs> there's certain classes. I am. Okay, yeah. So you know, like uh, Warblade and uh, Sword Sage and those sort of classes from. Oh, you, oh, you're talking. You're talking about the book. You're talking about Nine Swords. Now you're speaking my language. <laughs> yeah. So I was. I was. I really missed that style of play where you had like these little abilities that you could use that were mm -hmm. part of a martial character. That sort of like made them feel like they had a certain identity within their like martial prowess. That was yeah. Like... In in my house, we st in my house we stand the Book of Nine Swords for two reasons. One, it can it um 
it com it's apparently committed the un unforgivable sin of giving non-mages something to actually do. I know. <laughs> and two, um, it had it committed the even more verboten sin of dr of drawing inspiration from something that it that wasn't a, that wasn't a pulp book from decades ago or um or the Tolkien melting pot for the umpteenth time. Yeah, exactly. So, like, that sort of feeling of like. Ha having martial characters actually have something to do other than like I hit or like I apply my sneak attack or stunning fist or something like that like having multiple options at once that's what I really wanted to capture when I was making Crescent and you'll see a lot of that um, in the system too and then like to touch on a last thing that doesn't really have too much to do with D&D &D, but just sort of in general um, I'd actually been looking through some other systems because uh, I was interested in starting a new campaign in, a in another system at that point and one that I stumbled on um, was uh, Burning Wheel, because it, I got recommended it by one of my friends. I, um, yeah, Burning Burning Wheels certainly um, certainly gets around. Yeah, and uh, something that really intrigued me about Burning Wheel as a system in comparison to just D and D in general is that there were certain rules based around like some of the more just role-play aspects that you find in, in TTRPGs. D&D mm -hmm. um, sort of very much so takes like a almost like hands-off approach on those sorts of things, um, where most of the rules are just like mechanical like combat rules or rules to solve like certain situations or something like that. And there's very few rules that are like based around how characters interact with each other and interact with the world in a sort of more interesting and deep way and have like their own stories and stuff like that. And some of that I saw in Burning Wheel really fascinated me, um, coming from a mostly D&D &D, uh, background at that point. So um, I'd say those are sort of like the core things that I was, I was doing in response to playing 5e. And I mean, I still love 5e, but mm -hmm. uh, I was looking for like a different experience and I wanted to, to build that myself to some extent. Um, now, now, what's in, what's interesting is you meant you mentioned you mentioned that uh, those ki those kind of motifs that you wanted to that you wanted to veer away from. Um, and yet, what I find interesting with given that now given that when I was studying, I didn't re I didn't realize the um, five the five E background is you are going with a com with a complete. Free with a complete freeform system that's solely attributes. I'm unless I misread it or or it or it skipped past me. I don't think you guys have a skill system per se. It's attributes and techniques. Exactly. Um, while there is a pseudo skill system, there's nothing official. So the a, a little a little like uh like journey into the actual system itself mm -hmm. um there is one mechanic called uh, areas of knowledge um which is basically just like if your character knows a lot about the certain subject or something like that they can have like an area of knowledge in it so it can be like i use medicine as a good example like if you have some knowledge of medicine or something like that then you uh would be able to better interact with medicine it increases your die roll in the same way that perhaps having like proficiency in medicine is but the biggest difference is that there's no set of like skills. Mm -hmm. Area of knowledge is basically just anything you can come up with that your character is interested in. Yeah. So you know, in like in three point five or five e or something like that, you have like your history, and then you or like you have your like knowledge arcana, knowledge boba, and like in three point five, there's two million knowledges, right? Yeah. That um, I do I, and this. It's funny that you mentioned that because of one thing regarding skills and D and D that I've said that um, is a little is a little bit um, a little bit of hitting raw nerves, and so mm -hmm. and some pe and some people have cried foul about me saying this, but I am of the firm of the firm belief that the bi that um that the big pro the big problem with trying to with trying to put a skill system in D and D is that it wasn't designed for it. Um, in the same way, in the same way that other games with skill systems are built around it, like say, um, World of Darkness and its and its subsequent sister games, whether it be Exalted, um, Scion, or well, if you want a really deep cut, Street Fighter. Um, those games are built around their attribute skill format. 
the closest thing that D that D and D had to skill systems in its early days were the were the percentile skills that certain classes like the thief or the ranger had. Um, and even and even and even that's a bit generous because they weren't universal. You didn't have a all roads lead to Rome approach with them. Um, and when, now, when it comes to when it comes to the attributes, I saw that I saw that you have um, you have fourteen attributes total, and yes. this pro this prompted a question th a question that I have because a lot of times when you have a when you have that wide of array of j of just attributes, even 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 if you just have a smaller array, there's a temptation to go to go as even as to go as even as possible, or in some cases, the dreaded choice paralysis. What are what are some of the means to uh, that you have to kind of a, to kind of address that in character creation? In terms of just like what to choose and like the that sort of problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. I I think that the biggest thing for me personally is. The way that I, I usually approach character building in Crescent is I think about like what the character is about more so than I think about what like the skills that they have like what what sort of techniques they're going to end up having. Mm -hmm. So I'll think like okay is this guy like does it does is he gonna be like strong or uh, quick? Is he gonna have a lot of knowledge? Is he gonna like be able to overpower any situation? Something like that. Um, in terms of, like, how I build my characters, at least, I, I think of the attributes sort of as, like, if you are satted into these attributes, then that's a representation of how you want your character to act during the campaign. Because they'll directly affect how they act, like, you'll get bonuses to the, the scores, and their fighting style will also be based somewhat around, like, what type of attributes they choose. So... Usually it's like if I have a personality for a character in mind already, then it becomes very easy for me to pick which attributes they have because I'm basically just building that personality in the actual scores themselves. Yeah. Um, and because each of the scores or each of the attributes represents something like d different, like mm -hmm. drastically different, um, it becomes pretty easy to do that. Like there's always like that sort of, of debate, like, is this, I, I guess, like, going back to, like, D&D &D for a moment, like, there's the debate on, like, is this, would this decision be made with, like, intelligence or wisdom or something like that? And that's just, like, a, a question that everybody has all the time and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I don't really think that comes up as much in, in Crescent so much because the attributes are, are built around, like, pillars of, of personalities that are not similar enough to be very comparable the majority of the time. Either physical attributes of them... Or mental attributes. Yeah. It's also important to note that um, picking up new abilities is entirely sort of locked behind increasing attributes. Right? Mm -hmm. You need, um, like, as you increase on levels, you get more attribute points to distribute. Um, and each technique that you can learn um, has its own set of attribute requirements. And it usually has, you know, one primary, um, which would be like the highest. Um, attribute that you need and then secondary and sometimes like tertiary and even some more attribute requirements so when you know what you want your character to do or what you want them to focus in you usually um just know that you're gonna increase that every level um every time that you can and then you'll be you know supplementing that with uh maybe some other identifiers of your character and be working towards particular aesthetics or things that you want to be able to do either in combat or out of combat because half of the techniques in the system are um, for combat but the other half are for interacting with the world interacting with people and solving challenges and um, uh, interacting with a lot of the other uh, game systems yeah now when it comes to when it comes to techniques um, one when when I look at, when I look at the way when I look at the way combat and utility techniques are set up with the um with the prerequisites of di of different um attributes, um 
I end up I end up calling back to a, to a bit of a pet peeve that I had with the feat system in both D and D and Pathfinder, and that that is the, that is when it came to, when it came to certain when it came to certain feat chains the prerequisites that you had to do um, effectively effectively made it that it made made it that you had to do a, a ridiculous amount of pre planning and I've as I've mentioned several times over the years the whipping boy for this kind of thing is if you remember whirlwind strike in D and D three point five and um, Pathfinder. Yeah, I, I the example I also like to use is um, there's a there's a charger build in three point five that requires a ridiculous amount of like pre prep and, and feats and stuff like that. I definitely know what you're talking about. Like mm -hmm. you'll end up with some feats that you're not even actually gonna use because they're prerequisites to other feats that you need. <laughs> yeah. So my my question when it, my question when it comes to it is for for example, for the re pierce um example. In order, to, in order to get that, would somebody need four accuracy and two instinct, or could it be either one? Uh, it is a combination of both of them. Mm -hmm. um, so the i the idea is um, uh, to explain that a little bit. Almost all of the techniques have at least two requirements um, to be able to pick up, uh, and there's usually at least one technique at every level. Um, for every combination of uh, attributes, um, usually it'll be like either one or two, sometimes three, depending on the the combination at that level. Um, so you usually have some so I got a I got array of choices in terms of like what you have for your attribute uh, spread. Um, if you're wanting to like construct a perfect build or something like that, like you would in in like a in three point five with like like some of the ridiculous builds and stuff like that. It does actually require a good amount of pre-planning um, in terms of like where do I need to put my attributes um, and what else do I need to pick up that would support this build to make it actually work. Um, so I can definitely see some like concern in in that area if you're like if you're not the type of person that enjoys like planning out builds and stuff like that in advance and you just sort of want to look at like. Oh, what do I have available to me at this level? Oh, I can't take this because of this reason and this reason and this reason. Mm -hmm. um, the the way that we've sort of gone about alleviating that is that um, I think that most people find it to be most people find that they actually have um, enough options that they don't have enough points to actually take everything that they'd want. Yeah. Um, that's what that's what I've found at like from our playtests and stuff like that, mm -hmm. where they're like, "Oh, there's so many cool things I can do with all these uh, with like what's available to me that I'm having a hard time like choosing between these two things." So you will see some abilities that are like, "Oh, that's really cool. I wish I could take that, but I don't have the the points for it." Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, what you'll find is like, "Oh, there's this really cool ability I can't take, but there's also this pretty cool ability that I can take." And in fact, there's like three abilities that are pretty cool that I can't take. So if you're not like explicitly building yourself around this one specific thing, then you still have like interesting options available to you at any given point. Mm -hmm. As far as min maxing is concerned, um, Crescent is designed in a way that um, the difference between a well built character and a um, you know less thought through character is not that great. Like you'll definitely feel stronger, um, but it's not. Um, to the level of like discrepancy as a uh, well built 3.5 character and a um, like vanilla just like class that doesn't have any prestige classes in 3.5. It's not like that at all. It's mm -hmm. um, uh, it's still you'll be relatively similar in in strength. You yeah. can't really game the system um, and get like a whole bunch of free stuff and meet all these crazy prerequisites. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's more just what attributes do I have, and how can I pick up techniques that complement each other? Yeah. Now, speaking of speaking of that, I want I do want to ask a bit a bit of a thing on the on the cord on the cord die mechanic. Now, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, you guys are using a D10 die pool. Where would it be accurate of me to to say that it's all, that it's all about getting a, getting 
being um, success based instead of sum based, where you're trying to get an, you're trying to get a number of die over the difficulty threshold. Yes, that is that's correct. It's it's based around like one good die result more so than like the sum of all of the die results that you roll. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, would it be fair? Would it be fair of me to say that when it that when it comes to when it comes to die rolling? Um, the the only thing the only thing that matters is just getting at least one die that's o that's over the th that's over the threshold, and if so, what if are subsequent hits over that um, treated as degrees of success? Uh, so that requires a little bit of explanation. So the, at the core, you're correct in the in the first statement. If you get one success over the threshold, then you succeed on that die roll um there's certain abilities that will say like for every time you succeed you get an additional bonus or something like that but most abilities do not say that at the core rule it just says you need this one success um the and most of the time that's like all that really matters there are times where it's like um for example like on, like on a critical hit in comparison to a normal hit if you get one die over the um, success threshold, then you've successfully hit the person. Um, but if you can get two die um, past a critical success threshold, then you critically hit them. Um, so there are some rolls that require more than one success, but the majority only require one. Mm -hmm. There are um, there are modifiers that affect um, the number of die that you roll, the number that you need to hit. Uh, to succeed and the number of successes um, that you need in order to uh, achieve whatever you're attempting. Right. Um, but at the core, like Logan was saying, it's just uh, one success against a threshold that is determined by whatever you're interacting with. Mm -hmm. Now, also, yeah, go ahead. Um, that brings me. That brings me to the question of of any sort of exceptional result, like and. To to go to go into what I mean by by exceptional results, I'm using that as a catch-all for um, for those kind for those extra rules based on certain based on certain die results. For example, um, for example, a f a fumble in World of Darkness that happens if you roll n if you get no successes and you roll a, and you roll a one, um, or or you or um glitch if, or glitch in um, Shadowrun, and of course. The whole critical success and failure in D twenty. Um, do you get? Do you guys have anything like that? If t if tens or ones are rolled. Yeah. So to to talk a little bit about that, um, it's it's a little bit different in combat and out of combat. Mm -hmm. um, out of combat, there isn't like any real critical success or critical failure um the way that you'd measure that is there's certain tasks that you might want to do that like require a little bit of time to do and might require multiple steps and we call those trials um and what that means basically is like uh there's not just one check that you're trying to succeed it could be like you need to succeed on three checks or four checks or something like that to be able mm -hmm. to pass it um, and each of the checks could potentially be a check against something else. Like, uh, I use the example of like, let's say you're climbing a cliff. That might be like testing your strength or your stamina or something like that, right? But let's say the 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 cliff is very steep or high or something like that. And instead of just like climbing up it, you might want to like find a good route where you'll have handholds all the way up or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that might test like your your accuracy or your instinct or something before you even start climbing. Um, so you might need like one check to, to find the route and then two checks to climb up. If you succeed everything, then that's basically the best result. You you find your route up and then you just climb it. But if you fail on any of those, then you can be put into a state where you're like struggling to, to maintain your grip or you're not on the right route and you have to find your way back or something like that. Something that could um, maybe like exhaust you as you're trying to do it potentially make you fall or um there are some situations in which like a, a single failure might like directly deal damage to you mm -hmm. um and that's like the closest thing that you'll come to like 
a criti- critical failure is like failing on everything um in terms of that all right and that can like in- immediately like exhaust you to the point where like you need to take a rest before you can continue on yeah um in combat there is no critical failure there's just a, a hit or a well there's just a success or a failure mm-hmm. um but there are specific things that you can critically succeed on the main one being a, an attack as i mentioned before um but there are also uh techniques and and uh builds that open up the ability to critically succeed on other things like you wouldn't normally be able to critically succeed when you're intimidating somebody, but you might pick up a technique that says, like, when you intimidate somebody and you critically succeed, then it does this additional effect, and it tells you what sort of effect it does when you critically succeed. Mm-hmm. But as a base, only um, normal attacks have a critical, uh, like, effect, I guess. Would a, would a critical success just be um, succeeding and rolling at least 110, or would it be... Um... A number of successes over the threshold so uh critical successes have a have a different threshold which is 10 by base like as you'd imagine mm-hmm. um and it's two tens to critically succeed so if you roll a check and you roll two tens then you critic you critically succeed on that check all right um but there are such um but there are like builds that make it easier to crit um for example like it's not 10 necessarily that you need to roll. There are abilities that will say, like, okay, you need to roll one less to critically succeed. So this time, if you can roll two nines, then you critically succeed. If you can roll two eights, you critically succeed, and so on and as it goes down. And there are some builds that are based entirely around reducing that number to the point where, like, you're critting on almost every attack that you're doing, and that's where most of your damage is coming from. Would that be two... Would that be... Um... In the case of two nines, would that be two nines exclusively, or two nines or higher? Nine or higher. All right. It's just a, it's just a different threshold. Yeah, I, f- I, fi- I figured that should be clarified because if it was if it was just two nines, then you, then it's then that's really just dumb. Sh- it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's um, li- it's lipstick on a pig is still a pig. Um. Now when it now um. A lot of a lot of games, especially games in the more free form end of the spectrum, tend to have some kind of extra effort system with within them. Some sort of some sort of limited pool that can be used to boost it, boost die rolls, um, do a do, do a do over, or have some sort of um, narrative edit. Um, examples I've given in the past for this kind of thing are Edge from Shadowrun, Willpower from. Um, World of Darkness, um, action points from D and D Fourth Edition, um, inspiration from Fifth Edition. Even though that's kind of generous on my part, um, yeah. Does Crescent have anything like that? Um, this is also another question that goes into the kind of category. So, uh, as a base, no, but there are abilities that let you. There are abilities that will let you reroll um, certain checks that you do, mm-hmm. um, and there are there's a race specifically that has an ability that boosts um, the roll, mm-hmm. which is basically the only uh, like m- like s- specific number modifier in the game yeah. <clears throat> well, well, that I'm aware of. There's but like sorry. It's sort of like a difficult question to answer because it does depend on sort of the context. Um, out of combat, um, there's a system called um, dedications. Oh, there's that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where um, every character has a um, like a personal goal that they're working towards at every step that sort of coincides with the um, main group objective. Um, a lot of the time, those personal goals are tied into islands that you visit. Like, you may um, have one arc on an island where you're trying to achieve something as a group, and then you all have um, your own objectives on that island that become apparent as you explore it. Um, And for that, you actually do get a pool of dice. um, And humans, I believe, actually get more. um, That you can add to any role that is associated um, with trying to achieve your goal. So in that regard, um, there, there's that mechanic. 
Um, and then in terms of combat, um, for like increasing your your rolls, uh, and even out of combat, there are techniques that have like recharge or specific components um, that will give you certain bonuses um, in certain situations. And then in combat as well, there's a system uh, called combat stamina, which is sort of like a pool that you have when you enter combat that a lot of techniques will uh, draw from. Um, and you may have to set, you may have a pool of like seven combat stamina, right? And then a technique might consume two of it. Um, and it'll give you an additional effect um, or some bonuses. Um, so that's one way to, like, a very, very common way in combat to boost roles is by using techniques, and many techniques have a combat stamina requirement. All right. Now, when it when it comes to when it com now when it comes to advancement, this question is was kind of answered by one of your earlier remarks, but when but are you but um. Unless I'm mistaken, you guys are going with a. Even though you're going with point with point bases when it comes to learning techniques or, or upgrading attributes, as beyond that, you're going with a level based approach instead of a experience as currency approach. If I'm getting that right. Yeah, there's uh, ten levels to the game, um, and uh, inherently, experience is gained through the completion of. Um, your personal objectives mm -hmm. and like major story beats and story arcs. All right. We don't have like experience per monster or anything like that. It's just you get a set amount um, when you complete a segment of story. Mm -hmm. Um, but e but even with but even with that, it's more a ca it's more a case of your of when it comes to experience, it's more on you're not spending the experience directly to to up to upgrade the character the upgrades happen at a, at certain experience threshold totals yeah yes all right i felt i felt that i felt that was some, something that i needed to um clarify now i want to talk a bit about combat cuz obviously we're dealing with a game with a lot of swash and buckles so um break out your errol flynn jokes because i know you got them or your zoro jokes or your lone ranger jokes or your Jack Sparrow jokes. There's a, there's a lot of material with this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, uh, Crescent is partially inspired by One Piece. Yeah, I, I was go I was going to I was going to I was tempted to bring that up, but I thought, nah, that's way too obvious. But thank you for thank you for um <laughs> um, cl um clearing that part up. It's a couple inspirations. That one was the one that I brought to the table. <laughs> Yeah, I have actually never seen One Piece, so it's it's half inspired by One Piece because only one of us has seen it. <laughs> um, but when it when it comes to combat, um, would I'm guessing that I'm guessing that with the action economy you're using, it's more of a point based instead of a instead of a um action suite like um like D and D has. Uh, yeah. yes. I uh, talking about divinity. You want to take this loading? Yeah, sure. So the main inspiration that I brought to it. I don't, are you familiar with the divinity series, like Divinity Original Sin, or any of those I, games? I have been I have been familiar with divinity going all going all the way back to Divine Divinity. Okay, so you probably have more experience than even I do. But um, <laughs> I'm not doing that. To, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to humble brag or chest beat. It's just. No. It's, <laughs> I, it's just. I'm. I am a researcher, and that means going through a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, um, I personally love the um, Divinity series, especially Divinity Original Sin, mm -hmm. um, the newer entries in it. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I took out from it was uh, a. What was the action point system? Mm -hmm. um, so, in Divinity, if for those that aren't aware, um, the characters have certain action, like a, a number of action points on their turn, um, that refresh whenever their turn starts. In Divinity, it's four, and our game, it's it's six. Um, and you have certain actions um, that you can take that will reduce, well, that will cost a certain number of action points. In our game, for example, it, to make a normal attack, you have to spend three action points to do that. Hmm. Um, 
the the biggest difference between our game and Divinity is that action points aren't just like a sort of like go all out and use all the action points you can on your turn. Um, because reactions and defenses also cost action points. So if you decide that you're like, oh, I'm just going to hit somebody as many times as I possibly can on my turn, then you might be able to get an advantage if you can like take them down or something like that. But you'll leave yourself open to a counterattack because you won't have the action points to block an enemy attack or parry it or dodge it. Um, you'll sort of be a sitting duck. There's like a, a base that they have to beat, but it's lower than if you were actually using an actual defensive um, reaction. All right. So um, combat in general in the system is really sort of like... It's really based around... Um, uh, action point management in some ways mm -hmm. and also it can be very swingy in one way or another um, if you can get rid of all the boss's action points for example then you can sort of get a few turns in where you're just hitting them for all your worth um, which is a really big benefit but if a boss is like defensive or something it might be it might take some different strategies to take them down um, so there are a lot of actions that characters can take and techniques either like change those actions they can even change the action points they cost for certain things mm -hmm. um but it's all about like what tools do i want to use and how many action points does it cost for me to use these tools yeah. um and give, given given the repertoire of abilities and the use of action points during during play tests have you ever had any instance of nova ing if you're familiar with that term I am not familiar with that term. Um, Novaing or go or going Nova is a, is a bit of is a, in in um in in tabletop parlance is when people try and blow all blow all of their damaging abilities in one go, typically early on in the encounter, and it ends up um really me really messing with the with the um with the flow with the flow of the encounter on subsequent turns. Because you know you you effectively blow your load too early, hoping that you can one sh hoping that you can one shot the big bad. It's actually um, something that we've. Um, it used to be the case that like very early on in development, that um, you could just sort of do too much mm -hmm. um, without like bothering to defend yourself. So it's something that we've paid very close attention to as we've continued. Um, it is a. Crescent as a whole, it's a lower magic system. You don't have as much access to like healing. You don't have like ways to save yourself as easily if like you get cheesed and just die, right? And nobody likes that experience anyway. And that was actually a big problem that we had in the very homebrewed 5e campaign, where all of us were so like there was so much stuff added to the system, so much below it in terms of damage and health mm -hmm. that like you could just unfairly, and, and this is part of Logan's frustration, you could just sort of ruin a combat immediately mm -hmm. um, by blowing your load. Um, yeah. So something that we've done is, like, we offer a lot of abilities that you know, are really cool, like um, whether they have a recharge or a large cost associated with them, that allow you to do a lot, but it's never gonna like, just completely wipe the floor um, and destroy a combat. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is due to us um, raising the base HP for characters. Um, again, because healing is more difficult, you don't want low levels to be as swingy as they are in, like, 5e, where, you know, you get hit by a goblin twice and you're down mm -hmm. when you're a wizard. Um, that just doesn't really work, and it's also a little bit... Uh, it's not super fun when it happens to you, and it also can just lead to a random TPK right off the bat. Um, so we tried to design the game in a way that abilities were interesting and fun to use and felt impactful, but they wouldn't um, just sort of uh, end the combat or be so strong in and of themselves that you didn't need to do or think about anything else. Mm -hmm. One other um, precaution that we took in certain situations, too, is um, there are certain abilities that are a little bit more swingy in terms of like whether they succeed or fail. Um, so in those circumstances, we've, um, well, for a lot of them, we've changed it so that they're more likely to fail than succeed. So if you want to use them, they just sort of just like 
uh, throwing a whole Hail Mary in some ways. Um, but they're a lot more likely to succeed if they have the proper setup that you can do on in turns. Yeah. So um, there's certain builds for sure that will be like that'll that'll want to use their like big attack that will like destroy somebody. Mm -hmm. But they'll probably want to set it up like a turn in advance so that it's a lot more likely to succeed than if like they threw it out and it's like oh maybe it'll hit there's like a twenty percent chance of working and it's just like the majority of the time it's not going to. But if you spend a little bit of time to to prepare it in advance, then you're greatly increasing the chance that it actually works. I'd probably <laughs> I'd probably end up taking that strategy because um I have I have been sufficiently broken by uh by R and by R and Jesus as defined by the XCOM <laughs> series. Which if, you, yeah. <laughs> if you've played any of those, or God help you, played any of the lo any played the Long War mod, then you are probably familiar with my pain. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I have, I play a lot of a uh, Fire Emblem. If you're familiar with that series. Oh, oh yes, and I and I have um I have spent many a time getting my ass kicked with with that one, or dealing with the fact that RN Jesus it um is 100% bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> ninety-five percent chance to hit, still miss. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it's definitely a, right. a problem. Especially well, yeah, since we... my, especially since my my means of breaking into um fi to Fire Emblem was Radiant Dawn on the Wii. <laughs> Not my smartest move. Yeah, we've uh we've tried very hard with Crescent to. Um, with combat, mm -hmm. make it so that you're really rewarded for working as a team, for um, making uh, careful decisions, for planning things. Um, and part of that is to support support builds. Mm -hmm. um, like, disposition and presence as an attribute. Like, both of those are very support-oriented, where disposition's about um, setting up uh, either, you know, enabling your teammates or setting up um, things to like flanking and presence you can use to distract or intimidate um, your enemies and all of those conditions um, they have different sort of stages um, and they are very impactful in a fight especially yeah. if you're cutting a boss and the boss is generally like in like a magical creature say uh, in like D&D &D, might come with a long list of immunities and invulnerabilities mm -hmm. in Crescent there isn't really that um, like there might be a couple but generally speaking um, you can use those abilities um, on bosses to enable um, the rest of your group or yourself um, to do more and it yeah. really is valuable um, to set up mm -hmm. it's not just a waste of time where you could just be hitting harder um, and hitting more yeah. Now, since you mentioned magic, I do I do want to get into that. You're now with Crescent, you're going for a bit you're going for something that skews a little bit more on the low magic end of the spectrum. Now, I've I've obviously gone through my fair share of lo of low magic games over the over the years, and there's multiple interpretations of that kind of concept. Um I'm what I'm curious is how how a low magic feel is ex is expressed through 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 the mechanics of um, of the system. Is it a case where magic is a highly expensive kind of technique, or is it something different? Um, so again, I can take this. Uh, so there are three attributes that I would say are like the pseudo magical attributes. Mm -hmm. Um. Purity and corruption are two summoning attributes, um, which let you summon in aid from, uh, like, well, I, I, it's there's some lore behind it, but corruption lets you summon in aid from like an almost like modern era, where you can summon in like modern weapons mm -hmm. um, that are obviously pretty strong, um, like basically borrowing them for a period of time to be able to use them. Mm -hmm. um, purity lets you extend your soul to create creatures which like magical creatures that can that can use some effects um and both of them are balanced in a way that they're pretty similar to what you can already do in the system as well um so like an uh, a, an animal that you summon in might act as like 
a weapon or like a weapon that you summon and obviously act as a weapon in some ways. They're just like basically weapons with some different tool sets attached to them. Um, the only stat that's like very magical in terms of like it's providing a completely new set of things that you can do is uh, connection. Um, and connection's gimmick is that it's entirely uh, an illusion. Um, so everything that you can do with connection isn't actually real. Uh, it's only real so long as everyone else believes it to be. Um, so for example, like connection might have like a fireball ability or something like that, like standard fantasy, like magic or something. But if that person, as they're like throwing that fireball at somebody, if another person, um, takes the time to examine the fireball, they'll realize that that's not even real at all. That's not something that a person can do. Then that fireball will just disappear and won't do anything. All right. Um, and obviously, like the rules behind like when you can realize something isn't real and stuff like that. And obviously, the more ridiculous an ability is, the easier it is to tell that it's real. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are certain builds that centralize themselves around like fooling everyone else into believing that they're like some powerful magician or something like that that can actually like make use of magic. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the things that are actually like real magic, there's no real magic that's available to the players as like part of the base system. The the magic in Crescent is it comes from islands. Um and like the weird like uh like reality almost the warping abilities that the the islands have mm -hmm. um but generally speaking players don't have access to things you'd usually consider like this is what a wizard does in another system or something like that like that's none of that really exists in um in crescent there's just mockeries of it all right now when it now speak speaking of that i do there was one there was one thing when it came to characterization that i kind of skimmed over i'd like to cover Especially given that this is a um, a free a free form type of creation and development, how much how much of a factor does the choice of race in character creation play? We tried to make it so that so one of, one of my other big problems with um, a lot of just other TTRPGs in general is like if you want this type of attribute, then you should pick this race because it gives you a bonus to it, right? Um, that's a sort of, like, standard thing that happens in, like, D&D, &D, Pathfinder, those sorts of games. Um, we really wanted to take a step away from that and just let you play whatever you wanted to play. Mm -hmm. So what the races do is they just... They give you some flavor for your character, and they give you a couple, like, abilities that um, basically, like, are distanced from specific builds. Like... When you're playing a character, there won't be, like, oh, this race is, like, obviously the most optimal one because it gives you, like, this that, that works with it. There are some, like, very specific builds that are, like, can make use of those abilities. But a lot of the, lot of the time, we try to make them general enough that everybody can use them if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, as a, as a good example of that, um, there is a race called the Inevitus. Mm -hmm. And their lore is that they can sort of, like see what's going to happen before it even really happens or like know something is inevitable like a, this is this is always going to happen in every situation mm -hmm. um and their ability is um that they can influence a die roll either by increasing it or decreasing it this is the, the race i was mentioning before mm -hmm. um in order to like skew it in a specific way so like if I'm sure that I like, if I'm sure that I'm going to climb up this wall or something like that, then I can skew my die roll even if I fail towards the the position that I can succeed. And they can do that a couple times per day. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's like generally pretty useful for almost every character to have, and just a generally useful ability in general. Yeah. I, I said general like four times in that sentence. <laughs> um, but like that's that's what all of the the races are designed around. That's the design philosophy. Just mm -hmm. different tools that are useful for almost everybody to have um it, when it comes to does it all, when it comes to the starting um attributes do, is that do they um 
does the choice of race determine determine the um determine a starting bonus or does it determine a um cap? No, it does not change any of that. That's actually that's definitely one of the things that we were trying to to create the system of resistance to. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted it to be like if you want to play this character and you want to have this specific build, then you can just do that. Like there's there's nothing that's saying like oh, you can't do this because your character is, like, it only lives for this amount of age and this, like, type of play style requires that you've been alive for, like, 100 years or blah, 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 blah something like that. Like, there's nothing like that in the system. Mm -hmm. um, it's just whatever you want to do goes, more yeah. or less. What I, what, I ma what I mainly meant when it came to, when it came to attribute cap is, um, is, because some, because I think one of the races is described as being, on the frail end of things, so I could see it being mm -hmm. rationalized that their um that their st that some of their physical abilities are at a are at a uh, can o can only go to a certain point compared to other races. But it sounds like that's not the case. No, the the way that we do that for that race is when they get hit, they take more damage, mm -hmm. and that's all that that is. So you can do any build you want to. You could like spec into a lot of vitality to increase your HP so like it offsets it or you could like go into quickness so that you can dodge all the like the attacks and you don't take any damage at all um but like there's nothing there's no cap or anything like that on it it's just a part of the race that you have to work around or build around all right now i know that i know that you guys are do, are doing um are doing are doing a web are doing a web support thing which I think it's the first time I've seen th this degree of web support since um, Open Legend. Um, but when it comes to the rulebook, what's the total page count that you're shooting for? Uh, <laughs> do you have any idea, Brian? <laughs> well, so this is something we've uh, you know discussed at length because in part of our decision to go the virtual route as opposed to a physical route. Mm -hmm. Um, is that because of the sheer number of techniques, it would, like, that alone would span, like, hundreds of pages. Because um, we're talking about uh, 400 techniques per level with 8 levels of techniques. Um, so, you know, math, it's, it's like thousands. Uh, putting that all into something physical would be a lot. So we've considered um, just doing the rules uh, and having that as something physical um, versus the whole thing. Um, or even just, you know, putting the rules into a PDF and having that be its own document and then having the techniques available on the website to view. Um, but if we just took the techniques out and we only focused on the rules... Um, I don't estimate that it would be more than, like, it'd be somewhere probably between 200 and 300 pages with all of the GM information, monsters, um, uh, like, homebrewing guides and, and all of that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I would, um, I would, cer I would certainly be looking forward to that, to that approach and pl plus some. Through through both through both the web version and the and the rulebook in the, in PDF form, there's pl there's plenty of means to make to make sure that everything is easily um, navigatable. And yeah. I bring that kind of thing up because um, navigation is one of, is one of those big sticklers of mine. Yeah. Um, personally, I. Yeah, per personally, I, I think that, um, like, let's say we released a book that was, like, just the techniques or something like that. I'm honestly not even sure how helpful that would be because it would be difficult to navigate through it and look through all the techniques and see, like, this is what I can use and this is what I can't use and stuff like that. It's already hard enough to do it in the form of, like, a, of like a Google Doc because we have it where we can just, like, sort of control F and, like, find the, the thing that we're looking for. Um, so, uh, I've actually gone in and made, um, some, like, preliminary tools to, like, search for techniques that meet these, like, requirements and stuff like that. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to make a character 
in the system like it makes it a lot faster if you can just like put in the attributes that you have and see like what do i have available to me right now and and stuff like that Mm -hmm. um so generally speaking the reason that we're like sort of moving towards that digital aspect is just because navigating all the rules and navigating all the techniques and everything like that is just so much easier when you have like those those tools that are available to you oh all right and and like I said, I'll be I will be very much looking forward to to seeing the, to seeing the result, and pr- and probably seeing how many um how many pirate jokes I can I can squeeze in much much like I squeezed all of them in during my runs with Seventh C. Um, and that's that's simply that's simply because, um, I I am an advocate during National Talk Like a Pirate Day. I was I was an advocate for don't don't try talking like a pirate because you're gonna suck at it. Play a pirate themed game instead. I actually uh I played a, a pirate character in my campaigns and I looked up like a glossary of like pirate terms and stuff like that. And I just tried to like sprinkle them through my RP, but it was really hard because I couldn't remember them. I had to keep going back to my glossary and be like, oh that's what this means again. Mm-hmm. It was really funny. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. But with that, with that said, with that said, I would like to sincerely th- to thank both to thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And if if at any point you guys would see fit to to return, whether it's to talk more about Crescent, to talk more about um about ver about varying about varying example builds with it, or just to shit or just to shit post, the door is always open. As That's I good often, to hear. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, as you're talking to uh, two non-coffee drinkers, you're also talking to two people who don't drink. <laughs> I didn't. Say, I didn't say it had to be liquor. I just said drinking is encouraged. Oh, cheers! I'll cheers to that with my water bottle. <laughs> Skull. Um. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>